Welcome to Travel Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Unseen Histories. I'm Peter Moore. Today we're off to witness the death of a king, the birth of a movement, and an allegation of witchcraft. Cruel necessity. This is how Oliver Cromwell justified the most shocking act in all English history. The execution, on a cold midwinter's day in early 1649, of the deposed monarch, King Charles I. Today's guest, Malcolm Gaskill, takes us back to the scene of Charles's killing. It was a dramatic event that came at the end of a tumultuous decade of civil war and religious conflict. The execution, as Gaskill explains, also preceded several other peculiar events. One, not far from London, was the founding of a proto-anarchist commune. Another, much further away, on the very frontiers of the New World, was an allegation of witchcraft. Malcolm Gaskill is Emeritus Professor of Early Modern History at the University of East Anglia. He's one of Britain's leading experts in the history of witchcraft, and he's the author of the captivating new micro-history, The Ruin of All Witches. I joined him just the other day, for a Halloween themed episode of Travels Through Time. Welcome to Travels Through Time. It's a real pleasure to be talking to you today. The book that I've got here, The Rule of All the Witches, is um, where I wanted to start this conversation. We're going to kind of loop back round to it towards the end of our format, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity to talk quite broadly about it as well, because I think it's such a fascinating um micro history really um first off though a broad question for you in you know kind of british education do you think the 17th century for all that happened the civil wars the the kind of moment like kind of monumental ways that we reassess the society that we live in all the experiments that happened do you think it's a bit understudied because often people know the two poles of the tudors and the dictators and in between things get a bit fuzzy i just wanted to like see if you had any thoughts on that oh the tudors have absolutely stolen the show i mean there's no doubt about that whatsoever and then of course the nazis as you say so i mean anyone who teaches in higher education is always trying to steer people away from tudors and nazis and show them what lay in between i think anybody with a specialism tends to think that their period is understudied or is incorrectly understood uh, incompletely understood. Um, but I think that, yeah, I think that the 17th century, well, it's sort of, you know, I think in publishing terms and in broadcasting it, there are fashions and it slightly comes and goes. But I think that the 17th century is something that people occasionally wake up to, whereas the Tudors just don't need any marketing whatsoever. They're just always there. Uh, and, you know, Henry VIII's, you know, sort of standard profile, his silhouette is just there is their logo, really, isn't it? So the 17th century doesn't quite have one. I think one of the things about the 17th century is just an awful lot happens. And I think from that point of view, it's perhaps harder for people to understand. I think people even at the time found it hard to understand quite the sort of the turmoil and the, uh, you know, the revolutions that they were experiencing. Mm. On the book itself, though, you write at the outset, only rarely do historians find such a fine grained microcosm of change a grand narrative told through the ordinary courses of daily life for the birth of springfield which is a community we'll get to um like the colonization of america as a whole belong to an age of transition between medieval and modern ways of seeing the world magic shading into science tradition displaced by innovation communities eroded by a more strident individualism lots of of interest in that but in particular I wanted to say if this is a story which has grabbed you quite so much can we find out about your genesis moment did it kind of leap out of an archive at you one day or was it a story that you'd known about at a distance for a long time and finally got to 
Well, it's a little bit of both. I'd like to be able to say that there was a kind of eureka moment where it did leap out at me, but it's a it's a story that historians of witchcraft have known about for a long time, um, but I just think has not been completely exploited, especially as a narrative story. So that, you know, there are kind of famous episodes and that this one, as I say, was known about a bit. But it, in the end, I think that historians sometimes feel that their stories do choose them rather than the other way around. It, sometimes a story just gets under your skin and you can't kind of shake it off. And this was definitely one of those. So I'd written a book about uh, English colonisation in America more generally and witchcraft, of course, came up, and then the story of Hugh and Mary Parsons and Springfield came up too. So out of that book, which was a great broad sweep across the 17th century, I did kind of fancy doing something that was a bit more micro-historical. And this really was the perfect story, and because it's well documented, and um, because it is just such a good story in its own right, it did sort of, you know, it sneaked up on me and um, and, you know, sort of tapped me on the shoulder and insisted that I did something with it, so uh, I couldn't really refuse. And you say um, it's well documented. Could you explain the nature of those sources? Is it? I suppose there's um, there's a trial, so that that would have generated a yeah. large amount. Is that the the central um, like kind of place for the evidence? Well, the most important uh, documentation for it is actually the pre-trial um, depositions, which are taken in Springfield. The trial itself takes place in Boston. But the pre-trial stuff is done as it's done in England, is done locally, and then is forwarded to the trial somewhere else. So that, um, so that what you get is a kind of a detailed snapshot of people in Springfield in 1649, 1650, early 1651, um, who were all gradually coming forward to the magistrate William Pynchon and telling their stories and their suspicions of witchcraft uh, against uh, Hugh and Mary. So it's extremely fine grained, um, but it's all really contained in evidence. Obviously, that these people in the past weren't trying to leave, um, you know, uh, notes for historians. Um, they don't always make it very easy. What they were really trying to produce was evidence that they could actually use in a court of law uh, in order to satisfy the uh, the, the, the witnesses and, uh, you know, and the, the, the apparent victims of witchcraft in their own time. I suppose it's probably best if I ask you to maybe give us an out, like kind of a brief sketch of what the story is, because um, there might be some things you want to leave to one side as as temptations for people to go and buy the book, of course, to find out the yeah, full story. Yeah. That's the uh, um, no spoilers, <laughs> no spoilers. Yeah, yeah, but what yeah. what is this story of Hugh and Mary Parsons? So, just a little bit of context. This is a story of a. Uh, of Springfield. It's a frontier town in uh, western Massachusetts. It's set in the distant but not too distant past and the people that go there are trying to set up new lives for themselves in the new world but they find themselves far from home, rather isolated, up against the weather and disease and predators, uh, the uh, na local Native Americans but worst of all what they discover is they have to live with each other uh, and of course, this is also a terrifying supernatural world of demons and spirits and witches. And then these aren't kind of Halloween witches living in caves or isolated cottages over the hill. hill. This, is a, this is an enemy within. And so that, again, this idea that they their own worst enemy is each other is this fear of one another, which particularly crystallizes in the image of a witch upon Hugh and Mary Parsons. So this is a, a very, uh, as I say, it's a remote, very hardworking, very competitive and rather cutthroat outpost set up as a fur trading outpost. But people farm there and do all sorts of things. And, uh, and whenever William Pynchon, who founds the colony and also becomes the, uh, the magistrate and the landlord and everything else, whenever he needs some new trade, like he, they need a minister, so he hires a minister, they bring the minister in. But he also discovers they need a brickmaker at some point. So they bring in Hugh Parsons and that's he meets Mary. And that's where the action really takes off. Mm, exactly. And it's very rich, as you say, from the evidence that you have managed to um, bring together. But apart from the historical evidence, I have to say that there's a great deal 
of quite satisfying detail about what life would have been like in this frontier community as well from what the architecture of the the houses mm. was like to the topography of the landscape to the kind mm. of people who would have come so there's all that to enjoy but I think one of the points that strongly came across to me is the the peculiarity of the community because as you say it's a blend of all sorts people are there for slightly different reasons some people might be there because they have a a, a strong sense of religious mission other people might not be quite so much but have just found themselves out there but mm. then there's this kind of geographic spread of um in terms of the origin of the people so um whereas a, a parish village which we could probably mm. equate this to a parish in some ways yeah apart yeah. from the fact that it's at the other side um of the atlantic ocean and that yeah. people are from everywhere. Some people are from the West yeah. Country. Some people are from Yorkshire. Some people are from Wales. And trying to kind yeah. of get that level. I mean, if you read any early modern stuff, if you know, if, if someone turns up who's different, who's an outsider, and even if you read yeah. Dickens, it's kind of it's yeah. a, it, it stands out. So this idea of trying to get all these slightly different identities and ways of seeing the world together, it, it, so that, yeah. that that is very interesting. Well, there's an idea that comes out of a lot of American historiography, which is that there is a certain homogeneity about emigrants, immigrants to America, as if because they're English, that's what really binds them together and that the changes are forced upon them by their experiences of living in the wilderness. But what's often forgotten is just how different that these people all are. And as you say, this is it's almost like they've been not completely randomly selected, but they've it's like they've all gone off into the, like the Big Brother house or something. You know, they're kind of crammed together in this place and they're they're different people and they have to learn how to live with each other. And so inevitably that they learn, and I think this is a lesson for all times, that that combining and belonging um also requires exclusion you know requires them to define themselves again so there's always just as as in english parishes like you say that there is a there's a there's a delicate politics going on all the time about who is in a certain kind of group or faction or some or certain kind of inclination or belief and who is on the other side of it uh, it's not always about isolating one particular scapegoat but it is about factional lines and divisions and that this was something which all people in Springfield, I think, had experienced in the old world. And a lot of them, I think, felt they would leave behind because it was such a source of friction. But of course, you know, they take themselves with them. You know, they, they can't leave themselves behind. And the way that they try to inevitably remake their old lives in the new world, mm. hopefully with better resources, because it's 17th century England, it's a period of the mid the mid seventeenth century a period of great poverty. However, there is still that kind of emotional core, uh, a negative emotional core. I think a lot of the time, which means that they fall out with each other and they hate each other and they suspect each other and so on and so on. So that that experience of um, of friction and turbulence in life is something which they are which they remake in the same way that they remake all sorts of other things in religion and law and the rest of it. Yeah, and you so you kind of explain how these are the absolute perfect conditions for accusations of witchcraft to be made and i think you um state at one point that um of all um the emotions it's envy which is the one which yeah. most kind of clearly leads to an accusation of of witchcraft and it and is. i suppose yeah. again looking more broadly at, at history it is within a period of maybe 100, 150 years, this is sits in the middle of that story, which is a, a period of history where there are more accusations of witchcraft than any other. Is that correct? Mm. Yeah, it is. So you start to see a um, uh, significant rise of witchcraft prosecutions in England from the 1560s. Um, it sort of spikes in the 1590s. And then there's a, quite a pronounced decline uh, in the the first couple of decades of the 17th century, but then a marked rise in the 1640s in the period of the Civil War. And then, you know, English witchcraft trails on till the end of the 17th century, but really by the early 18th century, it's pretty much finished. So yeah, it's just really rather smack bang in the middle. And witchcraft always is connected to political and religious and legal conditions of the day and economic conditions mm. of the day. And, uh, and I think that's something that people sometimes forget. I think that 
there's um, there's a sense sometimes that witchcraft is about a kind of random scapegoating. People don't really understand why people were accused other than the fact that they were female and they're poor, as if there was just some kind of sadism on the part of their neighbours. It's always much more than that. And I think going back to what you were just saying about um, the, the detail that I put into the book of daily life, this this uh, obviously isn't just padding. I'm not, not suggesting that you were suggesting it was, but it's. It, it, I think it's very important to understand the lives and the conditions out of which these accusations grow. Because as I say, they don't just spring out of people's heads because they don't understand why the chickens are dead or why the crops have been flattened by hail. They come out of personal relationships, mm -hmm. which are political, economic, social, and the rest of it. And that, I think, is a really important thing that we have to understand. And one of the only real, real ways we can understand that is through this kind of micro history where we really see the characters and we see them as vividly as we would understand characters in a novel or in a film. Yeah, you really do take us into the, I suppose, the weft and wane of daily life. And that is, it's almost a paradox, isn't it, that something that seems so... Um, irrational is the product of quite rational forces and yeah. is almost a logical yeah. conclusion of what would happen and I suppose a good example of this is in Springfield um, which is what, what is it, about 100 miles to the west of Boston is that about, that's right yeah 100 miles west yeah. um, that it, it seems like it would have been less likely to have an accusation of witchcraft um, leveled earlier in its settlement because there wasn't enough yeah. people. But like when there's yeah. more people come in, that's right. then it kind that's of becomes, right. uh, which is a, a again. That's exactly it. So, so much of the, the rise of English witchcraft uh, accusations comes from conflict of overcrowding, overpopulation, uh, insufficient resources and competition for those resources, which is really is one of the characteristic features of English parishes in the late 16th and the first half of the 17th century. Springfield and New England in general just doesn't quite, in the early years, it just hasn't quite got up to those levels of unpleasantness. And that's, I don't want to sort of make that too simplistically, make that point too simplistically, but the fact is that uh, it's, you just really do need those preconditions and that uh, you, that the the early settlements of the east coast of uh, of New England do fill up quite quickly, and then you need satellite towns, and then you have border disputes between those satellites and the original town, and so on. So you quite quickly remake, I think, a lot of the conditions, not all of them, but a lot of those conditions uh, that were familiar in England that that lie behind witchcraft accusations. Well, we're going to get back to this a bit later on, but as you said, this story sits at the heart of a really fascinating um, period of history for other reasons as well. So let me get into the heart of this format, which is to offer you the opportunity to go back to a year in the past and to ask yes. you which year, if you could have a calendar year, which one would you pick? So my chosen year is the year of our Lord, 1649. <laughs> okay, well, let me let me get you to justify that. What was interesting enough about, and, and I want you to talk broadly rather than in specific, because we'll get down into the detail in a moment, but um, what was the, the, the kind of the motivating factor for 1649? Well, 1648 is not bad, and 1650 has its charms, but there's something about 1649, I think particularly because... There's an opportunity here to to see both, you know, a, a huge drama at the head of top of society and to look at some dramas at the very bottom. And I think because of the, uh, the, the great ructions that take place in England at this time, I think that that really gives it a, a special edge to something where which I would really like to have uh, go back and witness in my in my TARDIS. Okay. And uh, just to see and to capture. So I think particularly for a historian like me, a cultural historian, historian of emotions, to really just so I know a lot of the details, but to really soak up some of the atmosphere that would have been there in the, in these events. That's a very, very good point, um, because we often we're left with the documents and um, what the archive yields to us, but not always with the sense of atmosphere that created the documents, which mm. you have to kind of create yourself in, yeah. In, yeah. In, a, in a way. So this is an opportunity yeah. for us to maybe talk a bit about the... Um, Mm. The, the climate and, and the, the feelings of people. Um, mm. We're going to do this in three scenes, um, and you've picked three quite 
distinct theatres of well, like kind of, well, how should I put this? To they're not distinct theatres of history as so much as they're uh, distinct settings and maybe mm. expressions of a similar like kind of yeah. seamer thought. Maybe um, the first one though, I think, has been described as one of the most monumental moments in all of English history, maybe British history, if you wanted to tack that on as well. Um, yep. Tuesday, the 30th of January, 1649. What happened and where where would we be? So we'd be in London and we'd be heading to Whitehall if we could push our way through the crowds, uh, which there would have been absolutely unprecedented scenes. Uh, around a black silk clad scaffold, at window height, the first story window height at the banqueting house in Whitehall. And they would have been waiting for their king, Charles I, to step through the window uh, to approach the executioner's block. Yeah, so this is the execution of King Charles, who has taken his country into civil war. Is there, has he got any like kind of lingering elements of support. Uh, do, do you think um, maybe we'll best start with that idea of the mood? Would it have been a great excitement that he is finally to be dispatched and no longer to be born with this this person? Or I don't know, how, how would you like kind of summarise the mood at that time in on that day? I, I think certainly t tremendous excitement as there always was at any kind of execution but obviously the execution of a king was something really was absolutely unique but a lot of conflicted feelings i think i mean there undoubtedly would have been royalists who were present who thought this was an abomination but i think even among parliamentarians there would have been those who felt that things had got out of hand and that there was a you know even among those who felt that there could be no no more negotiating with the king, that he had betrayed the people, that he was a traitor against the people, I think there was something very deeply frightening about executing the head of state, uh, who, after all, claimed that he was divinely chosen by God. Maybe this was going against God, God's will. Nobody knew what this was going to usher in, not just a kind of political crisis, but what kind of providential divine judgment this might bring upon England and of course that there are those who were the signatories to the death warrant who had to really steal themselves because the die was cast the, the stakes couldn't have been higher and that when they signed that death warrant they were the men that were going to have to step forward to take the consequences so I think you were going to get a great uh, a, a great range of opinions in that crowd but a, a kind of giddy excitement, but a, a sort of a queasy one as well. Not a joyous occasion, but one of, 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 of a certain kind of trepidation and ultimately mournfulness, I think, about the king, whether they like the king or not. So this, is, this happens after the king's trial. Is his charge high treason, I think, um, or, or something of that, that order? So he's been tried as a, as a kind of regular subject. I suppose, which I think he um, he refuses to acknowledge the power of the court over him. So yeah. it's, it's a it's a kind of quite a tangled thing. Do we know what do we know about the the actual events of that day? Is it well recorded? I imagine it would be. Yeah, there are a number of accounts um, which give us uh, quite a a degree of detail about proceedings, but also actually a sense of the mood as well. I think it would have been absolutely electrifying in Westminster Hall on. Uh, Saturday the 27th of January. Um, there is a court of, uh, High Court of Justice which is formed. Charles doesn't even accept the authority of that, so they're already off to a bad start. And when the Solicitor General John Cook begins his opening speech, Charles taps him on the shoulder to tell him to stop. And then when John Cook doesn't stop, Charles hits him quite hard and the end of Charles's silver cane drops off rolls onto the floor and then something really kind of magical happens is that nobody picks it up now the king when the king drops something the king never picks up his own things no one in that room picks and charles is forced to bend down and pick up the top of his silver cane and that's a deeply symbolic moment where something has already changed quite dramatically however 
that Charles um, is not doomed at the moment he gets into that court. The, the the common lawyers who are trying to push forward this are feeling their way forward. You know, they're not absolutely full of providential zeal about what they're doing. Um, there's nothing inevitable about Charles being tried. There was nothing inevitable about the civil war being fought. There's nothing inevitable about Charles being found guilty. And they are just... It's really the fact that Charles refuses to apologise, refuses to accept the authority of the court that gives them uh, really what they need to see it, to see the trial for, you know, t onwards to its conclusion. But yes, Charles is being is a is on trial for uh, uh, for treason. Uh, the, the charge is this: it says uh, the charge says that he had upheld in himself an unlimited and tyrannic tyrannical power to rule according to his will and to overthrow the rights and liberties of the people. So what you're getting presented here is a, is a conception of sovereignty that doesn't belong wholly to the person of the king. What the, the lawyers are saying here is that there is sovereignty, sovereignty in the people. And of course, we've heard a lot about that in the, Bre the pre-Brexit and post-Brexit years about this idea about what sovereignty is and where it lies. And as with Brexit, it's a vague concept, sovereignty, but it's a very emotive one. And this is one where Charles, uh, this is an area where Charles really falls foul of this. He thinks that he owns everything. He has all the rights in himself. But the lawyers are asserting that there is a kind of sovereignty that he has abused and therefore that he has, uh, he has broken his sacred bond of trust with the English people. And for that, he can he must be a traitor. And this is why I suppose um, to refer back to something he said before. The death warrant um, obviously comes after the trial is concluded, and I know there's maybe fifty or sixty different signatures on it. It's quite a number of people, and I suppose it's the idea of um, maybe collective responsibility because no one wants to be mm. um, solely. Kind of responsible for such an act and i know there's a completely different history of, about those 60 individuals later on who were hunted down um, yeah, after the right. restoration in the most merciless terms which is yeah. a fascinating story in its own right but to the moment of his death can we mm. have a look yeah so um so the crowds are obviously already uh, excitable and massing and that charles is taken away from them he is sort of secreted away in St. James's Palace with his most loyal supporters. He's visited very poignantly by his children. Uh, he passes on a sense of, you know, what do you say to your children the night before your execution? So this is a rather kind of moving scenes here. What, again, whatever anybody thinks about the way that Charles has conducted himself. And the, the Bishop of London, William Juxon, goes to him uh, and they pray together and Juxon prepares... <clears throat> Charles spiritually for the death that is coming uh, on Tuesday morning. So on, on the Monday night, Charles sleeps very badly, predictably. Uh, the next morning he gets up early. He is dressed in black silk with a blue sash. And at 10 a.m. he's taken from St. James's to the banqueting house and then faces that window on the other side of which is this huge crowd, the scaffold on the huge crowd that's waiting to see him go out and face the axe man. It's... Is any of this, because this is on Whitehall, isn't it, which is a, a kind of yeah. a thoroughfare which survives to this day, is it? Mm. Is the kind of, I suppose, the architecture of this, is, is it all, can you see where this happened today? You, you can, know? you see entirely. I, I, I was at a party in the banqueting hall a couple of years ago and I just, I just found my eye just keeps straying over to the window because there is the window. You know, everybody knows which one it is that, that Charles stepped out of. And so, if, but if you walk down Whitehall today, yeah, it's the the exterior is is pretty much the same. There's a there's an early German engraving of the execution, and again, it's it's completely familiar. Uh, the, what you look up at today is really what they were seeing then. Um, so it's uh, yeah, it's it's if you can if you imagine there being a scaffold just at that level of the first floor window, you you pretty much get it. And of course, however busy Whitehall is with tourists or whatever today. It's nothing compared to the way it was in 1649. If it was dangerous to sign the um, execution warrant, as we know it it was subsequently, we know that, um, 
to actually perform the deed of execution in itself must have oh, yeah. been the most. I mean, that's the job no one really. Well, I, I don't know if that's if I can say that. Maybe some people would want to perform the deed, but um, how how did that happen? Did, was was well, it a kind of disguised figure? The, yeah, the 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 executioner was um, was hooded, masked, um, and it was. Not only do we not know who it was who executed the king, but even at the time it was a total mystery. So it created inevitably uh, a lot of kind of conspiracy theories or or um, speculation, let's say, about who this actually was. I mean, at the execution itself, let's just just describe that for a second. So Charles steps out and has a speech prepared and says, you know, he, he presents himself in rather a Christ-like way, that he is a martyr of the people. And he also very famously says that a subject and a sovereign are clean different things. So he's asserting an idea of liberty, which is actually at odds with those who have signed his death warrant. He says that, you know, that the king is is chosen by God and gets to say everything. And of course, those who have condemned to death and the man who's just about to cut his head off uh, has a very different idea. This is all inaudible. So Charles starts sort of speaking to Bishop Juxon, who's standing at his side, and he says, look, I'm just, I'm now, I'm going to heaven and I'm going to my incorruptible crown. Mm. There's this idea that the English crown that he's been wearing has been destroyed by the English people, and he will go to an incorruptible incorrupt, one in heaven. So they tie his hair back, he puts on a silk cap, he, he leans over the block, he prays, and he says to the executioner, who's standing there with the axe, you know, when I give my signal, I finish my prayer, uh, and then you can bring the axe down. But the, there is an awful lot of speculation about who this man is. He doesn't say anything. Uh, no, normally, the, an execution would come forward and say, behold, the head of a traitor, drop it into the crowd, whatever. But he doesn't say anything, whether it's to give away his voice or his accent. Maybe he came from abroad. Nobody really knows. Subsequently, after the after Charles II comes back in 1660, as you say, they, hunt, they go hunting regicides, even hunting for some in New England as well, because they've fled across the Atlantic. Some people just get a bit panicky. There's a man called William uh, Hulet who is sentenced to death as being the executioner. The sentence is overturned because it's just nobody's really sure whether it was him. There's another man called John Big who's so terrified that he's going to be accused of being the executioner uh, that he sort of runs away and becomes a hermit. So there are all these kind of individual stories about people who might have been the executioner, but nobody's really sure. But anyway, it's Charles has his uh, puts his head on the block, he waves his hand, and the 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 axe comes down. And it is said by tradition, and this is not completely verified, that an enormous groan is emitted from the crowd in Whitehall. That goes back to your question, really, about what you know, the, what the mood was, what the atmosphere was like, what were the feelings. And I think if there was a groan, and I can well imagine it, I'm sure a lot of people who did groan were not people who were necessarily for or against the king but just felt that really what they were witnessing was something truly terrible. It's very interesting because I suppose Charles is to the very end unswerving. He has no sense of either repentance that he's, he's not going to stand there and, um, and apologize for his behavior in this temporal world. At least he, no. to this very end, he is and just with that very act saying, I will raise my hand when I'm ready. It's retaining control, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. It seems very significant. And do you know anything about the international response to this? Um, maybe on the continent, in 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 the old maybe Catholic countries. Yeah, well, I, I mean, everybody in Europe and in England signs up to an idea of the great chain of being, and that means that obviously God's in His heaven, and all authority passes down passes down to kings and then that filters down to um you know right through the lords and right through to the, the commons and down to the very poor and even down to the animals and the stones of the earth that's the conception everyone understands that's the natural order so that what's happened here is that the great chain of being has been broken in the middle of it so this has a potentially devastating kind of psychic effect on absolutely everybody but politically it's very frightening indeed if you happen to be obviously a crowned head of a European monarchy, because it shows that possibly that this uh, idea of sovereignty where of absolute monarchy, that's where the, the monarch has all the power into unto him or herself, is has been very successfully challenged. 
and that actually really there perhaps there's more of a social contract going on and this is an idea of the social contract you hear much more of in the 18th and the 19th centuries but perhaps what charles's execution has done is established that there's a principle of consent between the monarch and the people the people even quite ordinary people have to somehow support royal rule and there must be some reciprocal relationship so the crown heads of europe are absolutely horrified and terrified by this there's a sense that that uh not just monarchy but patriarchy itself the, the principle of government again we hear a lot about the patriarchy these days but patriarchy without a definite article was a form of government it was governed by the heads of households and that could be true of ordinary people, but it was definitely true of royal houses too. That was a model that sort of replicated itself right down through the social order. This had been severely damaged. Fascinating. And also it takes us beautifully on to, and it's something which I know much less about. So you're going to enlighten me here quite a lot. But um, yeah, this is this is quite different. We're leaving London behind. Still in 1649, of course, but what's happening this time? Let's have a look at it. This is the story of the diggers and particularly of one man, their leader, whose name was Gerard Winstanley. And on the 1st of April, 1649, they did something which in their own way was almost as revolutionary as the execution of Charles I, which is that they started digging, as their name suggests. They started planting parsnips and carrots and beans uh, in the parish of Walton, between Weybridge and Cobham and Surrey. And they promised to pull down the enclosures of the gentry uh, and to declare that the land couldn't be owned by anybody. And actually, that the poor, if the poor were hungry, land must be made available for them so that they could eat. And they called upon others to join them there. And this was a rather, this is a sort of, a, I suppose they were, we would call them an early commune, but the idea, which actually has an awful lot which resonates in our own times, a lot of ideals that I think we would respect to do with the land and to do with um, you know, basic expectations about people being able to eat, um, at the time was actually deeply terrifying and again threatening to the great chain of being, threatening to patriarchy, uh, threatening to lordship and... Uh, traditional land ownership as well it's um and especially when seen in connection with what had happened in whitehall before but there's a wonderful um little phrase that when i was reading about the diggers i picked up and it's from i think which is a, it's kind of like a manifesto that he puts out which is a famous text isn't it and yeah he talks yeah, yeah. about the land being the common treasury for all which is yes that's um, right something rich in poetic overtones but it's um it, it is it really captures what what he was thinking when stanley so um is is this um connected as well with this post-civil war questioning of authority and how a human life should be lived is it is it all connected together into this great um like kind of decade of change it's all very much connected uh there's a sense when charles is executed both before but especially after that the world is gradually being turned upside down and that this is a phrase which is associated with a political movement called the Levellers. And these were led by um, a man called John Lilburn. And that the Leveller writings, which were very much um, focused on a, a sort of, well, what would we call it today? Not, uh, well, a sort of social, uh, social justice democracy, I think, really. It's not too strong a word. I was just checking it before uh, it's kind of anachronistic uh, objections. But I think they, that's what they were about. And that John uh, Lilburn and the Levellers were, uh, you know, were real mavericks, extremely brave. And uh, but they were a very political movement. And that a lot of their, their, their ideas were associated with Cromwell's new model army, with the so-called independents who were really breaking away from, uh, you know, the, 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 after the Civil War, that you get an incredible uh, range of opinions on the parliamentarian side about really what should the future of England be. So the levellers are very political, but Gerard Winstanley's diggers, they are more economic, I suppose. And so they call themselves, start calling themselves the true levellers, um, always these breakaway movements. 
and that they're focused really not on the the on you know male suffrage and other things that the levelers are interested in they're really mostly interested in farming on common land for the benefit of all people and as you say this phrase the common treasury has a beautiful kind of poetic resonance and has been often often quoted in in folk songs and uh, Billy Bragg and others have talked about the uh, the diggers and this idea of a common treasury. Now there is this idea in English political thought about commonwealth. So England is known as a commonwealth. Thomas Cromwell under Henry VIII said, you know, this this England is a commonwealth, but it didn't mean a free for all. It didn't mean some communist state where actually that everything is shared in common. It had much more an idea of a hierarchical state, the commonwealth. It just meant the nation really. But uh, but this idea of a common treasury is something really very new and different. It's this idea that uh, God hates poverty. God doesn't want the poor to exist. And that they're really that they're in, there's no hierarchy in the Bible. There are no landowners. God hasn't ever ordained that some people should work the land and some people should own the land so that the land should be available for all people in order to feed themselves. So should I um, see this, would it be right to interpret it as a, is connected to puritanism in a way that's because if they're getting back to first principles in the bible is that is that yeah. right or was it it is exactly yeah yeah i mean puritanism can you know is a very very broad heading but it's it is undoubtedly under that heading yeah it's just that puritanism it splinters off into lots of different things and it has religious dimensions and it has economic and political ones as well so it becomes actually by the 1640s extremely complicated and you start getting religious sects who are really breakaway groups from a more mainstream kind of presbyterianism in england some of them are kind of completely wild so that the the diggers get associated with a group called the ranters now the ranters really are just kind of you know, they're sort of anarchists and they just believe in having a good time. Um, and they say, well, look, if God creates everything, God created sin too. So when we when we commit sins, that's a kind of sacrament, isn't it? Well, of course, a lot of people say, no, it's not. I'm just thinking it's got a, a slight um, Judean people's front feel to this. Probably. Yeah, there, you know, I don't know where actually clenched fists, but, you know, <laughs> there is something of that kind of atmosphere. But it's but again, it's not they are the, the levelers are very militant. But the, the 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 diggers are sort of gentler, I think. So that you you know you you uh, cited there the the uh, manifesto, the the true level of standard advanced was the, probably the most famous one. Uh, Jer- Winstanley wrote a number of tracts, but this is probably the most famous one, and it begins very beautifully. In the beginning of time, the great Creator Reason made the earth to be a common treasury to preserve beasts, birds, fishes, and man. Um, and then he went on to say that God never intended quote one branch of mankind should rule over another. So this is a very kind of ecologically holistic vision of the way that people should live on the land. And you can see that this isn't just a sort of proto-political, but you can see that actually there are ideas of the green movement and, and ecology and of protecting the environment already seeded in Win Stanley's uh, vision of the way that England should be organised. Yeah, absolutely. Because we're... Um... Um, talking a bit about Win Stanley, I, I know he's a, he's a London cloth trader. He's he's moved out um, to to Surrey. Is this a long planned thing, or does it just kind of very organically sprout up at this time in the spring of sixteen forty nine? How does it come around, and and what what's the fate of it? Does it does it endure? Yeah. Well, I mean, Win Stanley doesn't intend to go. I mean, his his cloth trading business basically collapses in London. And uh, he's forced to move out to the country to what he calls his country life. And this sort of initially is sort of rather pejorative. He doesn't really want to do this. Um, but he becomes there. He's, he reads a lot and he listens a lot. And as you've said, it's it's a time of great change. It's, it's really kind of blowing in the wind. And uh, he becomes convinced for, that the, the future of England lies in small, self-governing, self-contained, self-sufficient egalitarian rural communities and he also thinks that the he says this he says for matter of buying and selling the earth stinks with such unrighteousness he basically turns against the ideas of property and money he starts to really believe that proper, that money is the root of all evil he really starts to believe that the, that there's nothing that god intends about the world of property and trade and actually people just need to 
a kind of well it's what colonists actually come to in the in new england call a sufficiency of land just give us a parcel of land that we can live off and we'll be happy i mean not all the colonists in new england are happy with this i should say but that certainly is the ideal but this is certainly this is one perhaps more than many colonists that whilst at home gerard winstanley lives by and it's one that um, um, of course upsets a huge number of people who don't want this don't want them doing this to the common land particularly because of what it symbolizes which is again the the the, the destruction of some what has been seen as the natural political order order of things and coming so soon after the execution of charles the first it's it feels this is a very sensitive time it feels like this is another um you know blow laid at the roots of the you know the traditional political order of the country absolutely and you can see uh, but it's also i suppose for us today looking back in um in the long view at this that it's quite an attractive idea of the diggers i have to say i i'd, I'd quite fancy going along and doing a bit of digging because there's um i suppose it's that horatian ideal in a way but also it's connected to rousseau in a way and the transcendentalists and like later heritage and themes of thought which is um so so it does have its place but what was the what was the fate of this little experiment yeah well they they get kind of moved on from walton um the the local landowner whose name is francis drake not the francis drake but a later francis drake um they just basically harass them and they send gangs in they burn their houses uh, they prosecute them uh, and so the, the, the diggers move on from St George's Hill and they move to nearby Little Heath in Cobham and they start again. They plant their crops, they build some houses. Uh, and as I say, they really do behave like colonists, New England colonists, but in their own place. They find their bit of common land. That's going to be part of their common treasury. But there, the, the local land lord, whose name is Parson John Platt, he initially is kind of sympathetic, but he turns against them, against them quite quickly and he persecutes them, attacks them. And that by April 1650, they've been driven away, but not before that the idea has spread to some other counties, Kent and Northamptonshire, and Buckinghamshire, where other little digger colonies spring up too. So they're, they're richly symbolic, I think. But they don't really have a hope in hell of surviving because the powers of of law and landowning are going to be are going to crush them. Yeah. And so that the the diggers are moved on, they are prosecuted, some of them are jailed, and all the settlements are destroyed. But of course, what we have are Win Stanley's words. And this is the great thing about the story. No trace of them survives. But we have, you know, we have this digger vision which survives in you know, the true level of standard advanced and other things that uh, Win Stanley and others wrote. Yeah, and it's also, that is absolutely a legacy. And um, it's also, there's something really interesting in the in the action of doing something which, you know, on the surface is so um, commonplace, maybe just planting vegetables, but it being mm. such a powerful political statement that it cannot yeah. be tolerated. We can't. We cannot yeah. possibly have these people doing this because it's not what they're exactly. doing; it's why they're doing. Uh, everything is so interconnected. So, as you say, that even planting beans is somehow in this great chain of being is symbolically connected to authority. You know, so it's it, it, it's nothing kind of escapes the, uh, the this structure, and that by behaving in this non-conformist way. And it's kind of religious nonconformity. Sure, that's you know that's what all these Puritan sects are. But it is it's political nonconformity. It's about saying that really that if you know we need to do things differently. He's not looking at the top of the state. Win Stanley's looking at the streets where he sees beggars and thinks this can't be part of of the, the future which we need to build for ourselves. Hello, it's Artemis. For some time, we've been working with the visual historian Jordan Lloyd, and we've been telling you about his fascinating colorization work. Well, recently, Jordan has launched his new project. It's a website called Unseen Histories, which showcases a broad range of fascinating historical material. You can read feature-length pieces there about female fashion in the Victorian era, or beautifully illustrated extracts from books like Susan Denham Wade's A History of Seeing. 
For those of you who have enjoyed Jordan's colorization work in the past, there's a full range of remastered photographs from the archives of the Library of Congress. It's history for our times. Do have a look for yourself at unseenhistories.com. Well, it's fascinating to put those two things together, the execution of the king and then the beginnings of this experimental new community or movement. Really, really fascinating. But we've got one more um, place to go. And, of course, it has to be has to be Springfield, really, doesn't it? Have you to, have to go to Springfield. You have to go to Springfield. And um, you, you picked a particular day, which is the 30th of May. It's a Wednesday. Um, and so we're in Springfield, Massachusetts. There was a bit of a... Um, um, in the book, you described this a bit of uh, tugging and pulling between Connecticut and Massachusetts over where actually Springfield lay, which was quite interesting to, yeah. to see yeah. the boundaries taking shape. And there's some wonderful maps. Mm -hmm. I, I love a map. And you've got some really detailed maps of Springfield right at the beginning of the book so people can get a sense of it. But if that's the the geography of it, what is happening in this frontier town? Just, just tell us on this day. There are only about you know, maybe 100 people, 40-odd households. So everybody would have turned out to see what was going on. There was a re real buzz about the fact that there was going to be a slander trial. Now, you know, the, the, these colonies, the, everything sort of happens for the first time, you know, in, in quite a short space. So that they'd never had a slander trial at this before. But in the old world, uh, slander, defamation of character was very common and extreme. Well, I say extremely serious. It's not something that anybody would be executed for, but it was something you had to do something about because your reputation in a community was absolutely everything. If you were defamed, you you had to defend yourself. And so this is an instance where uh, a woman who has arrived, her name is Mercy Marshfield, great name. She uh, She's a widow. She's arrived from further down the Connecticut Valley in Windsor, after her husband dies, his business fails. So she moves up to Springfield to be with her grown-up children who have settled there. Mary Parsons, local woman of the south of the town, starts putting it about that she's brought the devil with her from Windsor. There are rumours in Windsor of witchcraft and of people you know, making pacts with the devil. And that Mary Parsons starts to think this has come with Mercy Marshfield. And once she starts putting it about, this is when Mercy Marshfield takes action, goes to the magistrate, William Pincham, reports Mary Parsons, and this is why they have a slander trial. Let's talk about the mood as well. We'll get onto the slander trial in a moment, but we started with this and the execution in Whitehall. It was a tense, mm. excitable mm. one. But if anything, within a small community like this, there must have been a similar element of um, kind of pent-up emotion which drove mm. these events. Do you think by the time, because I know you move through the various years and you talk yeah. about when there was a cold winter and when there was a good harvest mm. and mm. often y y this kind of colours the history that's taking place. Is there anything in, in particular in Springfield in 1649 which which makes, which charges this atmosphere up? There is. Um, the it's been a, It's been a hard winter. The crops have failed the year before. Um, children are sick, there are fevers, children quite often, we, we don't know what it is, possibly diphtheria, they have had attacks of smallpox. There are a lot of child deaths and uh, I think this does create a mood of, of kind of, uh, you know, sort of stoical acceptance of what's going on and trusting in God, but also these are Puritan people who feel themselves you know, very challenged by diabolical temptation, not the devil coming in the night necessarily as a, a man with horns and, you know, black tail and so on, but this sense that they are being tempted within and therefore that they are sinful and they're unworthy and these things that are happening to them are judgments. There's something about New England generally that people sometimes forget, which is unlike England, it could cease to exist. So even at the execution of Charles I, the worry is how will England look in the future? Whereas in New England, it could be this experiment could fail completely and we will just be, we will be wiped off the map. And that so for each individual community, that anxiety is even more intense. And because Springfield is such a, is a, such a frontier community, it could fail. It's just not big enough to survive. So that there are these anxieties which are about children and households and about having enough to eat. 
and about livestock surviving these very cold winters that they experience. But also that by 16, I mean, the news of the execution of Charles I undoubtedly reaches, uh, maybe it hadn't re reached exactly at this point, but it could have done. We don't really know. But that these are people who absolutely have to try to get on with one another. They rely on one another. And the, I think that there are plenty of expressions of amity and goodwill and charity between these neighbours in Springfield. But there is always the dark side of that. There are those who seem to be angry or they seem to be, you know, not playing ball with, ball with the customary rules of the community. And Hugh and Mary Parsons are definitely in that latter category. So I think that there is this big sense that the, the, the colony of New England might fail. And then there's this more micro sense of there is there are disturbances in the neighborhood that really we need to we need to deal with. And I do think that it that as as happens in England, with many suspicions of witchcraft, what happens initially is nothing. Or rather, people just sit on these feelings and they do build up. And that it's people are often afraid of witches for sure. But they're also afraid of taking action against witches. They're afraid of putting themselves forward in the same way that you or I might think, oh, well, you know, I don't really want to go to court or I, I even I don't want to phone the police about this. Or I don't, you know, as soon as you do that, you put yourself into a into a kind of a, uh, you know, into a public frame where you've set a ball rolling so that people don't run to the magistrate. They just allow their complaints to build up a certain kind of critical mass. But that's really building up by this point in 1640. And as soon as this slander trial takes place, this is actually the first stage in which the, the Mary Parsons's feelings about witchcraft and the accusation of witchcraft against Mercy Marshfield really come out into the public forum and stop just being something that's whispered about in, you know, in, in the alehouse or in, in, in doorways when people meet in the morning. Is, um, is this accusation entirely in keeping with what you've learned out, well, what you've found out ab about Mary's character? Was she, um, is there anything, I suppose, in her personality that, makes you feel that she was likely to end up in a, in a situation like this well to some extent yeah she's a she's come from a uh, uh, a very puritan a uh, little like a sect really community in wales and she very much expects that she is going to become one of the you know the chosen elect a member of the, the the one of the saints as they would have called it in the church we don't exactly know about that because unfortunately the church records a lot of don't really survive for springfield but there is she is that is very much her mentality she feels the devil is present in her thoughts all the time and she just tries to cleave to god so there's that in her there is already as there is in many others a very polarized way of looking at the world she is undoubtedly she reveals that she is suffering from some kind of mental illness it could be postnatal depression it might even be postpartum psychosis which we know now affects about one in a thousand women so it's rare but fairly recently the poet laura dockerell said that she, when she had postpartum psychosis she felt as if she'd be hijacked by a devil and it's very interesting that even the modern um, sort of experience of postpartum psychosis might evoke these older images. So that could be well what Mary Parsons is suffering from. She certainly has delusions. I'm uh, pretty sure she actually subsequently has hallucinations. So I think this I, this paranoia that she develops about Mercy Marshfield is something which is part of her character, but I think also part of the fact that she is unwell. Um, but I do think there's also a, a, a mood that, you know, Mary Parsons doesn't create the idea that witches are creeping up the Connecticut Valley. There has been a trial in Boston in 1648 where a woman is executed. And William Pynchon, who is the magistrate, has actually served among the judges for that trial. So the, the, this is witchcraft is something that people are starting to talk about, even if it doesn't immediately send them into some kind of frenzy. Uh, so it's out there in the ether. And I think in Mary Parsons' own mind, she draws down some of that atmosphere that maybe other people are just shrugging off. And for her, it becomes something that she can't stop talking about. And that her neighbours do notice in her that she seems obsessed by witches. 
Now, we today might look back and say everybody was obsessed by witches in the 17th century, but that simply isn't true. And that people are very discerning and that most people never accuse anybody of witchcraft, never suspect that they're bewitched by anybody. And even if they did, don't do anything about it. So that she's, Mary Parsons, by saying this, is doing something rather risky, even as she feels she can't help herself, by actually coming out and saying it. And that's why she finds herself initially on the end of a slander accusation, rather than Mercy Marshfield being immediately accused of witchcraft by everybody else. It just doesn't work out that way at all. So is, does this um, result in a confrontation then? in a legal sense are they brought together how does this slander trial take physical shape well it appears it appears that it takes place over two days um culminating on the 30th of may 1649 they are they are brought in confrontation to each other and mercy marshfield brings forward uh, witnesses so she brings forward two wit uh, witnesses john and pentecost matthews um who are people that mary parsons has confided in i don't know if she perhaps she did actually confide who she told that she thought that Mer mercy marshfield was a witch and even that mercy marshfield had bewitched their cow and their child to death well again the matthews don't immediately say oh uh mercy marshfield must have bewitched them because actually that she's their friend so it's really about where the lines of alliance and opposition are drawn they just don't the matthews just don't believe that mercy marshfield had killed their cow and their child so that actually they side with her and they say, well, look, she's just shooting her mouth off about witches. And that Pentecost Matthews recalls that she said to Mary Parsons, she says, uh, you know, you have to try and add the tone of voice, I think, but you can hear it. She says, I wonder that you talk so much of a witch. Do you think there's any witch in town? And so that it seems that Pentecost Matthews is drawing her out a bit, like saying, she's like she's saying, you do go on about witches a lot. You know, do you really think, you know, do you think that? And that shows that actually that Pente apart from anything else, that Pentecost Matthews doesn't believe it herself. And is actually really saying to um uh, to Mary Parsons, do you know, do you think perhaps you should sh shut up about this? But of course she doesn't. And that's why you have this you have this trial. Um I don't think it's a it's not a it's not a criminal trial in the, the sense that we might understand. It's more of a hearing and there's Basically, it's up to, um, uh, there's no jury. Uh, it's up to William Pynchon to decide who's telling the truth. And it seems pretty obvious. So to draw out the significance of this, would it be, because as, as you describe it, there's um, there's a lot of things that are always latent. I think that's probably a good way to think of it in within yes, these communities right. that are not expressed. Because I think you said in the... Uh, in the book at one point as well you know it was quite easy to make an allegation but to stand up that allegation was very difficult and that's why even if you look at the um um you know, kind of prosecutions for, for witchcraft in in this time very few of them result in any i, I suppose um convictions so yeah this is the moment though where whereby what has been latent and simmering for a long time is yeah. expressed in the open for the first time. So it's a cutting of the ice, I suppose. Is that right? Yeah, it is. That's absolutely right. And again, you see that in English trials as well. The we should just mention actually the the uh, the so called Matthew Hopkins trials, the East Anglian witch trials of sixteen forty five to seven, which is the most intense period of witch hunting that England ever sees, uh, which counts for maybe a fifth of all executions in the whole of the early modern period this is something that doesn't just spring out of nowhere it's the result of as you say these kind of latent or even in in east anglia suppressed uh anxieties about witches and specific fears about specific people and things that they have done so that when matthew hopkins goes out as witch riding out as witch finder general he's not accusing people of witchcraft he's allowing people who have their own accusations to come forward and to feel confident so that there are always the, and I think to some extent this is a little bit what the, the trial of the slander trial of Mary Parsons does it it encourages people to come out and say what they think but even then this is you know almost two years before uh the, the Hugh and Mary Parsons are actually really put on the stand 
and that everybody speaks against them. So this is very slow burning, but very gradually building up a sense that these are objectionable people. And it would be really great to get rid of them, but we don't really know how. Whereas, again, we sometimes have this very two dimensional view of our ancestors that they just sort of, you know, they just lurch from one crisis to another and that, that all their actions are very deterministic and, and unexamined and that they don't reflect on things. Or, you know, and to that extent, they are much more like us. They're hesitant, they're thoughtful, you know. And I think that even though we're dealing with the weird world of witches here, there is something about these intelligent people which is much more like ourselves and we would you know do well i think to you know to give them the benefit of the doubt sometimes of the fact that they are they are actually um thinking quite hard about really what is the right thing to do mm. and i think that takes us back as well to um my question right at the beginning when i was trying to draw out this sense of I suppose, a social history in your writing where you've gone down into the, the very minute d details of, of daily life. And it's mm. it's in that, it's in these subtle moments of movement from one season to another, in the kind of interaction of neighbours and the appearance of a new person in Springfield that balances shift. And then eventually we arrive at a moment like this. Um, yeah. Let's leave it poised because there's plenty, okay. of plenty of reasons for people to go and have a look at the book now. But I've got one question that I want to leave you um, with, which is a bit of tangible history. Yeah. If before you came back to 2021, you could bring mm. a tangible object back from 1649, is there anything particular that you would like as a reminder of this voyage through the past? Well, um oh so many things but only one this is a real desert island disc moment isn't it i can only bring one thing well i think i'd bring that silver top from charles the first's cane uh he had he didn't have much use for it after that um i don't know what happened to it it probably melted down with all the other royal silver for the uh um you know and put towards um uh, you know, the, 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 the Commonwealth and the Republic of England at that time. But I think that that is a very symbolic thing. I think it would sit very nicely on my desk. And it was a reminder, actually, of that moment when patriarchy fell apart, when royal authority collapsed, when nobody would do anything more for the king and where the king had become a treason, a traitor against his own people. So um, it would also be extremely valuable. So I would obviously like it from that point of view as well. Well, wow, all that in a very small object is a great choice. And this has been really enlightening for me, hugely enjoyable. Well done again on the book. Um, I Thank think it's, it's a book that will find many appreciative readers. So, Malcolm Gaskell, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. That was me, Peter Moore, talking to Malcolm Gaskill about 1649 and his new book, The Ruin of All Witches. I enjoyed it enormously and I recommend it to you all wholeheartedly as a perfect seasonal read. This episode brings us to the end of October and it's been a really great month for us with episodes with Susan Denham Wade, Michael Pineal, Oliver Gary Shaw and Justin Picard. You can catch up with all of those on our website, of course. And if you have enjoyed them, please do consider leaving us a five star review on Apple Podcasts, which really does help us along. We're going to be back with another episode next Tuesday as ever. Till then, goodbye. <laughs>